let's just name it, today's gospel sounds like Jesus is advocating cannibalism. Dracula would be thrilled. His Jewish audience, not so much. His listeners take his words literally. And Jesus, once again showing saintly patience, explains that the invitation to eat his flesh and drink his blood is an invitation to a different kind of life, a deeper and forever relationship with God, a life that exceeds beyond the bounds of our physical bodies. His life, his flesh redefines the life we live in this world and the next. And without the bread that feeds our souls, the living bread that feeds our souls, our spirits and our sense of God working in and through us will wither and die. Generations upon generations of faithful people have read these words in John and found comfort, strength, and challenge. God desires us to eat and drink of love incarnate, to ingest, digest, and become that love. Nourishment of our, in our spiritual lives strengthens us so that we may continue growing into the full stature of Christ. And as followers of Jesus, always learning, always growing, we pause periodically to check in with one another with God and with ourselves about whether we are living the values we most deeply believe in and profess. Throughout our lives, we make these kinds of self-assessments, both consciously and unconsciously, starting in our childhood. Different people and groups present values and invitations, sometimes very persuasively. And because of our human nature to want to belong, we may not give much consideration to the underlying values of a group of friends, a neighborhood or political group, or even a faith group, until some issue, some conversation makes us feel uncomfortable. And then we pause. We can imagine that the bread of life discourse gave Jesus' followers a moment of pause. Was Jesus really inviting them to nibble on his flesh or sip from his veins? Are they willing to stay in the conversation with him through the discomfort to find out more? Or is this too much? Or is it not the right thing? Does it not match their values? It's interesting to notice that Jesus is not apologetic or defensive about the good news that he brings. He is solid in his message, even as he, oh so patiently, explains his connection with the Father again. His focus is on the food of everlasting life and the invitation for us to eat and become one with God. It's up to us to, desire if, to decide if that is the food that we desire, if we are willing to commit ourselves, to adjust our lives, to be part of the family of God. We make these decisions as individuals and communities striving to live the good news of Jesus Christ. 
We make these decisions every day. There are two significant dates that happened this last week. Last Tuesday, August 13th, it went by without much fanfare, but Trinity celebrated its 159th birthday as a congregation. People started meeting for Episcopal worship here in Seattle in 1855. And in 1865, a vestry formed and officially established Trinity. Trinity's location and size changed dramatically through its first 50 or so years. Though our history reveals a constant quest to serve our neighbors in need. A small fun fact, the property where this building stands right now, when it was first purchased, was actually the site of a hospital for Protestants at a time when most of the medical care in Seattle was provided by Roman Catholic organizations. After World War II, when many men returning from war had trouble re-entering civilian life, Trinity housed a chaplaincy for veterans. And in the late 1960s and early 1970s, as Boeing laid off most of its workforce, Trinity provided space to the founding of a food ministry that grew into Northwest Harvest. Today, Trinity houses one of Seattle's only low barrier shelters for unhoused women. These are just a few examples of how Trinity has periodically paused to ask ourselves how best and most faithfully we can li continue living into our deepest value to proclaim by word and action the good news of God in Christ and in doing so, to build the kingdom of God. I mentioned two significant dates. The other date is today, August 18th. For the last 50 or so years, the Episcopal Church calendar of lesser saints commemorated William Porcher Dubose on this day. Dubose, who died in 1918, was memorialized as a New Testament theologian, uh, professor, and the de second dean of the School of Theology at the University of the South, where even today, many clergy are still trained. Dubose was, and I'm quoting his official church bio here, among the most original and creative thinkers the Episcopal Church has ever produced. He was admired and lauded by his peers and those who followed him. However, in the last decade, scholarship into his personal writings reveals that he was also a self-avowed and unrepentant white supremacist. He owned hundreds of enslaved people, and in his personal writings, he praised the early Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, 159 years after the Civil War, the Episcopal Church recognizes and deplores the sin of enslaving human beings. And in a conversation that Dubose himself might have approved of, given his belief in unmasking errors through open discussion, a process began several years ago to remove him from the calendar of commemorations. In June this year, the General Convention, by a near unanimous vote of 827 to two, approved Dubose's removal from the calendar of commemorations because of his unrepentant racist views that do not reflect our understanding today of God's beloved community. The gospel, the good news of God's love, revealed to us through Jesus Christ, does not 
change. How we understand it in our human lives and institutions does change. When Dubos was added to the calendar, it's not that in the early 70s racism was not a conversation, it very much was. But the self-examination of the church and its leaders did not happen very comfortably. And his writings were private. As a community who eat and drink the living body and blood of Christ, we are nourished for the spiritual life and questions about how we bring the good news to the changing needs and concerns of the world. Jesus wants to transform our hearts more and more into the fullness of serving God. And to that end, Jesus gives himself as the bread of life that we might metabolize that love, thrive and grow in our witness to the power of God working in and through us.